I am because we are. Somebody mentioned that yesterday. Mm, I cannot live my life outside my own community. When I have attended an achievement, it's not my own achievement. It's an achievement for my community, my family, my tribe, my religion. Therefore, everybody looks at me as the sole savior. And when I'm there, of course, I decide who to appoint and to place where. So that puts into question the issue of good governance, brings around corruption, brings around abuse of human rights. Actually, for me, poverty is the most critical challenge for Africa today. Yeah, uh, thank you very much again. Of course, uh, uh, as my friend said, poverty is the most you know, challenging aspect, you know, what we have to concentrate. The problem is you know, now the causes of all, you know, uh, uh, things what we have on the ground, like poverty, like hunger, like slums building, like, you know, disordered and, and uh, ecological damages and, uh, you know, abuse of, you know, child and as every aspect is you know emanate from the political crisis that means you know, the politicians are not in a position you know to understand their own role and they don't understand what a society means the meaning of a society because individuals are created in the image of god you know they have wishes they have you know dreams and they can realize their dreams and wishes you know if you know circumstances are well organized you know and politicians and good governors are responsible uh, for both cases, either po for poverty development, underdevelopment, or for development and for good kinds of you know, uh, atmosphere for, for, for economic development, for social development, for cultural development, and so on and so on. I think we have to address you know, the issue from the point, you know, you know that is the political system must be changed because as long as you know politicians you know stay indefinitely for 30 40 50 years you know they can create very sophisticated and complex situation which the next two generation cannot solve you know and we have to see it you know its totality all these aspects thank you very much okay yeah um, so, uh, from my point of view, uh, I'm trying to identify uh, African challenges in various areas. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Mr. Vincent and Professor Bekel said poverty, yeah, but I'm trying to, to see that as one aspect of African challenges because uh, from my point of view, I think you have um, major questions like uh, industrialization of African countries, for example. We know, we all know that they have a uh, lot of resources, lot of nat natural resources, but when it comes to the question of industrialization, that is a big issue. But apart from that, I will not uh, talk about African uh, challenges without mentioning corruption. That actually is a disaster. and. And when I say corruptions, yeah, it's in, in many ways, actually even those so-called, I mean, people who are supposed, let's say, to, uh, to bring help in African continent, some of them are doing uh, what I can say, uh, institutional or official corruptions, because I know from uh, my experience, you have some international organization working, for example, in Africa, when it comes, for example, to pay uh, taxes uh, and uh, all the stuff due to the state, they have like a panel of international organizations working with national governments in Africa, and they say, okay, the target of that is just to get some uh, administrative, uh, administrative easiness. And when you try to analyze that, when you, you want to have a, an insight on that, you find that in a change of the so-called uh, administrative business, yeah, they pay some man for that. And of course, uh, a big question as well is a question of electricity, a question of power. Because in Africa, yeah, in Africa, uh, it's a big problem, a power, even though 
uh, you have uh, countries like, I mean, my country, Congo, which many, many potentialities in terms of uh, exploiting uh, electricity, but nothing is, is being done. And uh, when they start like a new project, you will have politicians we involved in corruption. When it comes to countries like Ethiopia and, uh, and Egypt, they, of course, they tried in, in, in Ethiopia, they tried to, to build an electricity dam from uh, Nile River, but you have big tensions between Ethiopia and Egypt about that. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, we, I'm not sure if uh, I'm going to stay here for a lot of time because I have a, a long list of that. Yeah, so uh, to make a long story short, so yeah, I think. Okay. Coming from a demographic institute, of course, I uh, have to mention population as a huge challenge. Uh, the African population is set to double within the next uh, 33 years. Uh, some of the African countries are actually going to, uh, to, to more than double. For example, Niger is going to triple. And this is going to put a lot of pressure on these countries. So even if you imagine a very rich country like Germany would struggle if um, the inhabitants doubled because you have to build twice as many hospitals, twice as many schools, and so on to care for all the new people. So I don't want to say that people are a problem, but they put a lot of pressure and they make solving all the other challenges a lot more difficult. Um, now there are also good news about demographics, so I hope we get to talk about the opportunities as well. So I, I think as the last... I think as the last um, person who is answering to your question, I just can summarize. I think um, the uh, four answers showed very well that there is not the pressing challenge for Africa, but there is really a bundle of, of challenges. And you can't um, solve one of these problems without solving others. You cannot eradicate poverty if um, you have not a working economy which is creating jobs. Um, uh, one element of poverty is, of course, lack of education. But if educated people leave university and don't find any jobs afterwards, um, you cannot help them. And one of, this, um, one of the reasons is, of course, um, the growth of population in many African countries. So I think the challenge for Africa is really that it's Africa is facing a bundle of challenges and that for, for, face, for solving so many problems, a, a huge bundle of, of solution, of, me of measures is, is needed. A list, short list from uh, from your answers. You identify Vincent, you identify poverty as a huge problems. Uh, Bekele identify the, the political class mm -hmm. and uh, also the the aspect of, of governance. You related to, to good governance. Fernando talked about the industrialization. It's of course important and the basic infrastructure requirements and of course corruption. It's a huge uh, issue on African continent. Also, population, the growing uh, of the population, okay, it's, uh, it's quite important. I would like you to, to relate now to, to, to cultural diplomacy and uh, all that we discussed here for the, for the last two days. And uh, how do you think or how do you see that the instruments of cultural diplomacy and cultural diplomacy can help to, to mitigate to this bad aspect, to, to these negative aspects and their effects? So how can you relate cultural diplomacy, its instruments, and uh, with why, what we identified? Thank you. I hope I have understood your question. And I'll try to answer it. 
Uh, first of all, Africa must not wait for the rest of the world to come and address our own issues. Africans must sit down. Of course, they know their problems. And when I talk they, I mean African leaders, those who hold power, those who have the power to make policies and influence them and implement them. So instead of having to shift blame to the West or to other people, it is up to we as Africans to sit down through dialogue and put our, table, our problems on the table and say, these are our genuine uh, problems. And since there are genuine problems that face our people, how can we address them? Without, you know, being superficial. Be critical and genuine in order to develop uh, appropriate solutions to our own problems. But if you are going to wait for other people from outside to come and address our own problems, I think we are going to continue with that same song, you know, shifting blame, shifting blame, and putting our head in the sun without watching and addressing our own issues. So dialogue, a dialogue that is genuine, that is not superficial. So, uh, I agree with uh, my friend's statement. So of course, uh, the initiatives, first of all, must come from within. Uh, Africans intellectuals, especially, must be in a position, you know, to address the issues, you know, about ecology, about economic crisis, about poverty, and so on and so on. Uh, the point is, you know, as long as we have, you know, repressive governments, and these repressive governments are not alone. They are being supported, you know, by some countries. You know, for example, if you take my country, Ethiopia, it has been supported uh, in the last 25 or six years by the Americans, by uh, the British, and uh, to a certain extent by the Germans. So they know that things are not working in a way uh, they should work, you know. Why they are just giving aid, uh, just uh, any kind of military, uh, security, economic, and other aspects, while, you know, the people are suffering, you know. I think we have to see it from both aspects, you know. And the Europeans, you know, they have to understand, you know, from a longer perspective, you know, we need peace ag across the globe, you know. Whether we like it or not, you know, global capitalism touches our lives, you know. We are being dictated, you know, by the production, exchange activities, what is being produced in the West, in the Amer Americans. Economically, we are nothing, you know. Hmm? Culturally and, and in every aspect, we are being touched, you know, by global capitalism. Now, the point is, you know, there are two aspects in the way how politicians in different countries behave, and on the other side, you know, big companies, multinational companies, you know, working, for example, there is a very interesting book written by The Looking Machine. That is, you know, a book written by a British journalist who has worked over many, uh, many years and uh, he analyzed, you know, how, you know, the companies, governments, and African leaders are working together in plundering you know, the African wealth. You know. Now, we don't have to see it you know, from short-term term perspective. You know. huh? We need peace, we need security, and the coming generation will need, you know, to move across every country. You know, if the Germans want to go to Ethiopia, they need, you know, a good environment, but they can, you know, Poor, eh? that can't be paid. If even if you know, they can decide there and they, they work, you know, they can work and live there, you know, if the atmosphere is good, you know. So from that perspective, you know, the Europeans must stand, of course. And but first of all, you know, the pressure comes from wizard. 
That is what uh, I, I'm stating. But let me come to your uh, demographic aspect. You know, demographic problems are not the causes of the African economic and social crisis. On the other side, you know, the economic crisis and the political crisis ultimately, you know, just cause a kind of demographic problems what we see in many African uh, countries, you know, from the history of Europe as long as, you know, in, in producing you know, technological changes, industrialization, as long as, you know, the people are being educated, you know, they become rationalized, you know. And instead of bringing, you know, five, six, seven children, they become realized, now I have enough, you know, with one children. Or some say, I don't have time because I need for cinema, for, for uh, just uh, any kind of, you know, <laughs> You know, I don't like to have children. So we have to tackle it, you know, from, uh, you know, from, from the other perspective, you know. There are, there is a very good, interesting book, How Education Matters, it's written by two demographic professors. One is an Australian and the other is a German. Klinger, uh, Pope, and so on. That, uh, I forget them again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, he has really proved, in view, the two professors have really interestingly proved that education matters for everything, for population growth, for economic growth, for, for everything, you know. You know, as long as you know, we introduce the right edu edu education, as long as we introduce the right economic policy, we can reduce all this population growth. That is my just uh, proposition. you again. Um, well, uh, if uh, I would say something about cultural diplomacy uh, regarding the African challenges, well, uh, first, uh, me, Don Cummings, say like, defines cultural diplomacy as the fact of exploiting uh, element of culture in order to bring uh, people together and to achieve a common goals. But, uh, when we are talking about Africa, I think we, we, have, we still have many things to do, especially when, uh, uh, for example, we say about dialogue. Okay, it's a good point to create dialogue, to talk about everything, but the big issue is about African identity, for example. When you are talking, for example, from someone, you are talking to a North Africa, I mean, someone coming from Maghreb, uh, yeah, sometimes they, they feel to be uh, close uh, to Arabic people, let's say, than Sub-Sahara Africa. When you, you talk, for example, to, to someone coming from, uh, as we call it in Africa, Black Africa, yeah, we seem sometimes say, ah, people from Maghreb, yeah, they are African, but sometimes we, we don't speak the same language. Sometimes we... We have a major differences in terms of uh, uh, thinking, in terms of approaching stuff. That's, that's the first point. The second point, yeah, it's a good point again to talk about dialogue. But I think that dialogue should not only involve Africa. Because when you are talking about a crisis, you need to identify the actors of the crisis. And the, uh, the actors of African challenges or African crisis, African problems, are not only Africans, you have as well multinationals. If uh, you try to uh, read, for example, reports from Global Witness or even from The Guardian, yeah, they can give you a list of multinational companies that uh, are funding wars in Africa. That's the other point. And there is a question of trust in Africa. We don't, we don't trust each other. It's, it's easier for someone, for example, coming uh, let's say you have uh, someone living in Algeria, they can easily uh, support, they can easily back, uh, let's say, a rebellion activity in Morocco, in Western Sahara. If you, yeah, if you have as well someone living in Sudan, they can back as well conflict in Chad, North Kordofan, and all this stuff. If you come, for example, in Central Africa, yeah, you have Congos with its neighbors fighting each other. You, you, you see that's a question. It's a question we must face, we must build trust between us because we don't trust each other. African countries, African people are ready, I mean, to destroy their neighbors because of 
some, yeah, some interest. That's the question. Of, so for me, mm, if it comes to make a dialogue, yeah, it's a good point, <laughs> but we must include uh, Africans, we must include multinationals, we must include as well um, the international community, yeah, be, because today, uh, believe me or, or not, you can't live by your own. Even the globalization process will impose you to interact with other. So that's my point. Okay, so, so I come back to, to population and thanks for your remarks already. So uh, when you have faced huge population growth, it's of course the number of children per woman that is at the very base of it. And changing that changes the culture of a society enormously. It's a very big difference whether your average family has five children or two children. Now, um, I think you have to be very sensitive about uh, addressing fertility issues because it's, a, it's actually the most private decision you probably take in your life. And um, you have to be very careful not to do it the way the Chinese did it with a very repressive uh, one-child <coughs> policy. But for example, if you turn towards the Asian tiger states, you can learn a lot. You can learn that investing into education and especially into uh, girls' education, secondary education is a key point. Investing into health so that um, um, mortality rates go down for, for young children, that is what brings about the changes. And uh, you have to make a very dedicated effort if you want to, to um, make turn demographic challenges into demographic opportunities. And you have to actually give the politicians a very convincing storyline, I think. Uh, and the Asian tiger states provide this, uh, this textbook example. So for example, South Korea was back in the 1950s probably in worse shape than many African countries uh, at the time. And nowadays South Korea is one of the richest countries we have. And, what, and they went through a massive demographic transition by investing into education, into health, and by creating jobs. And um, people, th the scientists think that about one third of the wealth that South Korea has gained ca is directly linked to demographic changes. And I think it's very important to, to bring about these messages and to also explain what's underlying it, that you don't have to force people to get fewer children, but that you have to give them education, give them choices, that you have to give them healthy children, and actually fertility rates will go down, more or less, by themselves. So what, what can cultural diplomacy do for, for solving um, many of these problems? Um, basically, um, what is diplomacy? Diplomacy means that people from different countries or different cultures are dealing together with problems concerning both of them. So diplomacy at the basis can contribute a lot for making pe make creating an awareness for the fact that many African problems are not African problems alone, but global problems. And of course that um, comparable problems were existing in other parts of the world, for example, this Korean example you just mentioned, and the world doesn't have to be reinvented all the time. You also can um, learn from history and um, um, experience of other countries, other cultures. So, um, but if you add um, the term cultural to diplomacy, um, what is very important in, in my opinion is that uh, diplomacy does not only belong to, to politicians. Everybody or many people can really, really be cultural diplomats. I, I tried to show this in my talk about um, the, the role of cultural dim diplomacy and science diplomacy within international scientific exchange, also with Africa, and um, the long-lasting sustainable effect that um, these um, scientists, our Humboldtians, are really working as cultural demoplets, demoplet, um, diplomats within Africa. Um, between um, various African countries and they're doing a lot. I presented to you this network, African-German Network of Excellence in Science, Agnes, built by 
Humboldt alumni from, from, from many African countries. And they also, um, also this can, of course, enhance um, the international dialogue between people, not only um, on, on a political level, but on, on many, um, on many diff in many different parts of society. I, of course, uh, mentioned um, the um, example of, of science, but I think there are many, many other fields where people can, could really act as cultural diplomats for, um, for um, um, contributing to a solution of many problems Africa is facing. Getting back, because <coughs> some of you mentioned education. Education is so and so important. So I'd like to each each of you to to answer. What uh, what do you think that could be the mechanisms or the processes, or what can be done to to improve education in uh, in, uh, in Africa? Okay. Uh, first of all, the type of education that exists in many African countries has been part of the problem. As it was brought by the colonial system, it was intended to serve the interests of the colonial government, hmm? create the white collar job. And unfortunately, after independence, our governments have continued with this type of education churning out graduates from universities who have achieved intellectual knowledge but actually have no skills. Mm. They come out of the university, the only thing they can do is roam around the streets, hang around in towns. They don't want to go to the villages. There are so many opportunities in the rural areas. They don't want to engage themselves, for example, in agriculture in technicals, I mean, to work by their hands. So they keep hoping that tomorrow we come with another opportunity to get a white collar job. This has sort of recycled the, the poverty system in Africa. I'm glad governments now in Africa, like we have been sharing, are, are waking up to realize that no, we cannot continue with this type of education. We have to restructure our education and put a lot of emphasis and resources on vocational training. Equip people with skills so that when they go out, they can be job makers rather than job seekers. And that is the trend in most countries of Africa today. When it will be realized, of course, that's another challenge. I know, especially in my country, Uganda produces the best policies, but when it comes to implementation, there's a big challenge. So if these policies are implemented, our education system is overhauled and emphasis is put on you know, vocation training, creating skills so that people go out and create jobs. I think part of African problems will be on the way to be solved. Okay, uh, most of the things he have said, you know, of course, education matters. If uh, people are being educated, uh, uh, they become, you know, self-sufficient, proud, you know, they become creative, and that has been proven, you know, uh, many times. You know, without proper education, there cannot be, you know, any kind of social transformation. You know, the point is, you know, uh, of course, for example, if I take myself as an example, you know, I'm educated in Ethiopia until the 12th grade. I come here and then I have started, you know, from again from the scratch, you know, in order to understand, you know, how Europe could, you know, develop, you know, how uh, Europe, you know, could manage, you know, to transform itself, you know, from a very, you know, low level of economic growth in the 15th, 16th century to just a highly sophisticated, you know, uh, you know, social systems in every aspect, you know. And uh, I have, you know, tried to go through philosophical, you know, uh, discourses, you know, every kind, and then I, I come to the conclusion, you know, uh, 
in order, you know, to become consciousness in every aspect, ecologically, economically, politically, and the right education input is very important, you know. As long as, you know, academicians, experts are not aware, you know, as we said, you know, in many African countries, you know, there is no real contact between the academicians and the people, you know. People uh, are just left alone, you know. If you go to Addis, you know, the academician, the experts live their own lives, you know, without having, you know, any kind of contact, you know, with the ordinary people, and they don't take, you know, their lives into concern, you know. That is very important, you know. He, I've learned, you know, a professor, an educated person, you know, he believes that he himself is a part and parcel of his own society, you know. And African educated guys, they don't feel that they are part and parcel of their own society. And we go to school, you know, in order to be conscious, in order to get knowledge, and to to get to give this knowledge back to the people, not only by theoretical means, by practical means. Uh, we have to show them, you know, how they could tackle their own problems, you know, in every aspect, in agriculture, in, in, in vocational, in, in city buildings, in, in uh, community buildings, you know. There are millions of things to be, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, constructed, you know, from this perspective, of course, you know, we uh, cannot, you know, uh, solve all problems we have in Africa. We need, you know, what you said, you know, cultural, you know, uh, diplomacy is very important, you know, without cultural contact, you know, you know, uh, if you take the uh, human development, you know, uh, the development of language, the development of science, and the development philosophy, you know, you know, they come from every corner, you know, from Egypt to Greek, from Greek to uh, through the Arab to the Europe, and you know, from East Asia to India here. And this intermingled, you know, and fused and become dynamic factors, you know, in molding the European society. You know, from this perspective, you know, uh, we need, you know, real Af uh, European intellectuals, the Germans, our friends, uh, they could play, you know, greater lords, you know, just by giving us, you know, the right, you know, education and so on and so on, you know. Uh, that is, I think, a very important aspect, but, you know, the political parameter must be changed, you know. Uh, without changing the political parameter, you know, because politicians are not willing, as I see, you know, they don't hear you. you know. uh, if the European experts come, the IMF and the World Bank people come, they hear them, but if the Africans want to advise them, they don't hear you. you know. They don't take you into consideration. That is the problem we have. You know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm. So, if uh, I'm going to, to talk about improving education, yeah, that's so re relevant, as uh, Mr. Vincent said before, uh, we need to identify what what we want in terms of education. Yeah, it's true, like uh, the system of education we have today in uh, many African countries, it's quite uh, irrelevant in terms of uh, employment realities because um, the education system you have actually in Africa, they are based on the fact that we, are, we were taught and, and we are taught like in order for us to improve our lives, we just need to be ministers. Yeah, we just, every, everyone wants to be president. Everyone wants to be MP. Everyone w wants to be politicians, but we can't develop countries like that. Uh, the good point is about vocational training. That's so important because in vocational training, they don't teach you a lot of theories. They don't teach you about Platons, about Karl Hegel, and about Karl Marx, but they teach you, for example, if you link this and this, you have such a result. And that's what we need. We need practice, you see? And I think uh, families and, uh, and churches uh, have a big role to play over there because today parents teach their, their, uh, their kids like, oh, look, you must specialize yourself in politics, in international relations, in those, uh, I mean, high-ranking study of the society. But 
in terms of outcome, in terms of result, you have many people, for example, graduating in economics, in politics, international relations, sociology, anthropology. In the end, they are jobless. That's, that's, that's the big question, you see. But if um, we, the government, I mean, African government, try to put uh, support in, uh, in terms of backing vocational training, that would be great. And another point is, uh, I think it's not only enough to um, make like vocational training, but we sometimes government must put pro priority in terms of funding micro project for you, for example. Today, yeah, you have in Africa, the, the, many, many young people are jobless and even though they have some good project, but they don't have fund to, they don't have fund to, to launch their project. That's, that's another point. I think government should focus as well on uh, uh, funding youth project like entrepreneurship. So, yeah, that will be nice as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, just to quickly come to, to what you have said uh, and what uh, Vincent has also said, uh, I think vocation, uh, vocation, vocational training is very important. And, and a little uh, marketing advice. We've actually done a study on jobs in Africa where we focus on the agriculture and energy sector and there's huge, huge potential for Africa to feed itself and to feed the world, but they don't totally make use of that potential. So just to stress what you have said, but as I'm here as a demographer, I will now focus on something else. I think what needs to be done in education is also to focus on secondary education. Uh, in, the, um, in the Millennium Development Goals, the uh, focus was on primary education. Actually, quite some success has been achieved uh, in that area. But it is actually secondary <coughs> education that will bring about huge changes. So for instance, secondary education for girls is thought, is thought to be the most decisive factor in bringing down child mortality. Because a, a mom who has, a mother who has been educated, at least to secondary level educations, is aware what it means to look after hygiene, to provide her children, for example, with clean water. She knows what, a, about what vaccinations are about and so on. So I think it's, it's very much, if you discuss uh, education from a demographic perspective, it's the secondary education. And it's also what gives men and women the power to make um, really choices about the families they want to do, to engage in family planning, and to also find means to overcome obstacles when there is very limited access to family planning uh, um, programs, for example. So I, I think the new development goals have shifted their attention from elementary education to secondary education to some extent, and I think that's, that's quite uh, the way forward. So I, I very much agree that vocational training should be enhanced a lot, as well as, well as training on the job for those already um, working, because um, f um, the enhancement of vocational training for all of the reasons you already mentioned, but I would like to add another aspect. This could reduce a lot the enormous pressure on African university systems. Because many young per people are just going to university because there are no other options for being trained for a job. And this um, creates a great, great demand for places at university and makes pushing new universities in many countries a little bit like mushrooms. And these are, in, in many cases, very, very bad ones. Um, very um, badly equipped with a very low quality and in, in, in teaching and in research, if there is done research at all. It is a problem in Ethiopia, for example, I was just discussing this um, two days ago with one of our Humboldtians from Ethiopia. He is about to go back after two years research in Germany and he was so enthusiastic when he told me all the plans he had for enhancing quality teaching and research at his home university. 
So um, quality, this is another aspect I would like to stress, um, enhancing quality in higher and secondary education, of course, but also in higher education and research in Africa. This is my answer. Thank you. And I'd like to, to give the floor to, to the audience. Uh, we already have the microphone here. Uh, what I'm asking for you is just to shortly present yourself. Okay? And then to the that all. The name and the institution is for the question. Okay. And if you have a direct question for one of the panelists or for all of them, like a general question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Madiha, I'm from uh, Morocco. Uh, I don't give any name of institution because, yeah. Um, actually, I have something to add for Mr. Ferno. Um, we talked about uh, the trust between African countries and especially they get conflicted when they are neighboring each other. Um, I think that this is actually an external problem. The problem in, in Africa, and I think especially in my country, for example, in Morocco, we have a lot of under cultures. That means we have like the big culture, like Moroccan uh, culture, but inside we have like Berber, Arabs, Amazigh, and all this. And these are still fighting each other. So um, when, when we talk about neighbors and trust, actually, we should solve first the internal problems and then we go, we go forward to see what, what is the problem with the neighbors. Um, but um, as I, I had actually a question about what is the role of the uh, cultural diplomacy, for example, inside the country, how to solve these problems. And as well as uh, how the cultural diplomacy can improve the education, not in terms of education to learn languages, science, and all this, but another education, how to love each other. Because I think that um, when we have, uh, for example, um, love between each other, I think that in diplomacy we are, we are trying always to show that, okay, everything is okay, we will improve, we will support, we will do all this. But in the end, there's always an, a benefit that has nothing to do with emotions. And there is less emotions, I think, in this world these times. That's why we have biggest conflict. So um, I'm sorry that I'm talking about this, but uh, I think that this is important to solve such problems. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for everybody. I'll just, oh well, I'm Christina Arniolo. <laughs> I work here at Institute for Cultural Diplomacy. And I want to know, when you talk about Africa, what are you talking about in particular? Because we, we, when we talk about corruption or about industrialization, I don't think we can apply this concept to all the entire continent. Or I don't think you can talk on behalf of the entire continent because not all the countries are interested. And in the meantime, uh, when you have to face dialogue with uh, uh, with third countries or so the international community. I really believe, uh, yes, as you said before, that it's very important to care about identity. Part of the history of Africa comes from colonialists, and we know that a land without a story is not able So how can you deal with each other if you don't know yourself? This is what I mean. And uh, if the story was written by others, I don't know if you're really aware or conscious about your potential. And this is a problem that link all the entire continent, I think. This is maybe identity, the main problem. I have a quick one. Dr. Kaziak, um, this research that you did, that is really, really great. Do you think development corporations could kind of like influence this kind of findings? Thank you. Uh, my name is Dawit Samuel. I'm from Ethiopia, and I'm invited by uh, Dr. Fakada. Uh, by profession, I'm a social anthropologist, and it's very interesting to me because my background is in culture, cultural studies. 
regarding uh, my opinion about uh, the presentation here, you know, my brother here, he mentioned poverty as main problem in Africa, and the doctor mentioned about uh, good lack of good governance and corruption, uh, population growth, that I think the, this is for the effect it's not the cause of the problem. Because this is, you are right, these all are the effects. Because this is the problem now we see on the ground. But what is the cause? The cause of good lack of good development. What is the cause of poverty? That is the, the vital question. I think we need to answer that. Uh, and the other thing, one of you will disregard uh, foreign intervention in Africa. Because uh, from the very beginning, for example, if you are, let me mention slavery. In slavery, 70 million Africans were transported to the West. 70 million. So that is the young and energetic uh, force of the society. That effect is still there. The colonial. And even today, for example, in South Africa, in the neighboring to Ethiopia, more than five, six countries, they organized a military base, uh, including the German, the United States, the China, the Saudi Arabians, the you name it all. You know, that is for intervention. Why they are forming uh, what does that kind of military uh, or organization there? So that is my question. And the other thing is regarding in cultural uh, in education from my background, I think you know the this modern education creates you know a disaster problem in Africa. Then it's good for nothing. Because it, in, in cultural when I'm studying culture, the African society, we have our own way of teaching children. You, you, we can get all solutions from our culture. Than, than you know, transforming or bringing other countries from other other areas. So the key is for education. You know, we have to you know, leave us the society to leave to discover their own culture and to solve by themselves. I'm Femi Baboke I'm from Nigeria, but based in US. I, in terms of uh, structural approach to changes in Africa, I think, the, as we all know, that uh, racism, racism is in it as much as uh, tribalism. And that's the core base of our values in Africa. And without changing that, it's going to be impossible to move forward as a people and uh, education is very, very, very important to move people forward. And uh, uh, when you have a sound education, then cultural diplomacy will take place. And that is the uh, approach the uh, yeah, United States of America is doing in terms of educational process. Because nobody, nobody in America, as long as a child is young, and able to go to school, even if you are not able to go to school, they find a way to make it go to school. And education, primary education to secondary education is compulsory. If you don't, they don't see your Chinese school, then the parent will go to jail. America is not a dictatorship society. It's much more democratic society. But to move forward in Africa, we have to change our structural policies in terms of our education process. And the most important thing in life in terms of getting people educated and then poverty will go away. Thank you. I'll try to uh, answer the questions that I remember, but if I forget one, just feel free uh, to, to remind me. We will have also afterwards the break and everything, <laughs> and we can continue. So. Yeah, uh, but uh, I'll start uh, with your first question. 
uh, about uh, security and trust in Africa. Yeah, uh, I think maybe as you mentioned the case of uh, Western Sahara and Morocco, you said uh, the, the problems comes from uh, inter internal issues than external issues. Okay, maybe you might be right, but from what I know, in the conflict of Western Sahara, there are many actors involving that conflict. First, you have the state of Morocco. Second, you have Western Sahara. Three, you have a Spanish government. Four, you have Algeria. You have Algeria uh, backing, if I'm not wrong, giving Western Sahara government uh, weapons and military training. And you have the government of Spain, which is encouraging the independence of Western Sahara. So uh, by analy analyzing those facts, yeah, I'm convinced that the, the, the drivers, the layers of the conflict are, al are also external. See, but yeah, you might be right when you say there are many types of people, many tribes in, in Morocco. That's, all, that's, that's the common question everywhere in Africa. It's very hard to find in Africa uh, like uh, a, nation, a, a nation state, you say, uh, you have uh, one tribe and their nation. No. Everywhere you have, well, a, a melting spot of tribes and people coming from different regions. And uh, to uh, answer the questions of uh, the lady just uh, sitting uh, in front of me, uh, I think in Africa, we know ourselves. We know who we are. African people, uh, um, if even it comes to Northern African people or Black Africa, we all know who we are. And uh, there are studies which show that where we come from. But uh, the question is, it doesn't mean like uh, as we know ourselves, so it's, that is the, the solution. That is the, the solution to the question, no. Of course, uh, there are diversity in Africa. There are. Um, uh, let's say many uh, many clans in Africa, because uh, sometimes if you see someone from West Africa and you see someone from Central Africa and Southern Africa, I myself can recognize. And but uh, maybe for Western people, it's very hard to, uh, for them to know. Ah, this might be coming from this way. But for me, it's easier if uh, I hear someone speaking either English or French. I can go. Oh, this might be. Uh, probably coming from this part of Africa. Yeah, but we know ourselves, we are so diverse, but I think the diversity is not the cause of conflict, actually. But you have, yeah, I, you have as well, uh, as I said before, external actors involving the conflict. And sometimes you might have as well internal tensions when you have, for example, divide uh, in the societies. Yeah, that can be as well cause of tensions, but yeah, causes are many. Uh, I don't know if I can, yeah, I think from my point of view about your question, the co causes of uh, those facts that you identified as uh, effect of, uh, yeah, this government, all this stuff. But I think uh, the problem lies in many aspects. First, you have education. Everybody here was talking about education. If you are, if you are well educated, you say like, okay, if you have this class, is for the state, is for the, is for the government. When you finish giving talk, you don't need to, to take it with you. You don't need to take it home, and just leave it here. And no one will, will, will bring it home. But the question is, most of African rulers, I'm sorry, but most of them either they come from uh, dictatorship families or for military regimes. Let's say, yeah, not only black Africa, even from north to south. Most of, of, of presidents comes either from military regimes, they used to be like soldiers, captain, major, general. Then they say, okay, I'm going to demobilize, then I'll be president. And they keep changing the constitution as they want. That is the, the first point. The second point, well, one friend of mine, I mean, he lives in, in Dublin. He told me, he's from Dublin. He told me, Fernand, you, you know your problem is most of your rulers in Africa, they don't have what you call empathy. 
It means uh, if, I, if I want to eat, I must realize that you need as well to eat. But in African context, not like that. When you have one president in power, you say, okay, it's me or KO. But that's that. We are not going to, to develop like that. So, I mean, that is a huge debate. We can stay here even still tomorrow. So, yeah, that's my point. So where do I begin? Um, <laughs> maybe uh, first of all about uh, the, the diversity uh, of Africa. I think, of course, when I talk about demographics and population growth and so on, it's actually uh, Africa such it's very diverse countries. And for example, Northern Africa is in, in a very different state of the demographic transition. Your fertility, the, the North African fertility rates have already gone down. And the majority of people is actually in working age and could now harvest what we call demographic dividend. But we would need to create jobs at that particular, particular point in time. So whenever you want to take advantage of, a demo of your demographic transition, you really have to lo look closely at the state you're in. So no generalizations actually thing. Um, there was the very concrete question whether we, uh, with our studies, we reach the development agencies. Well, that's what we try to do. We call it discussion papers. That's, we try to bring new ideas. And to, in this paper, we particularly tried to put a focus on the potential of Africa, the potential it has with regard to agricultural, with, with regard to agriculture, but also with regard to energy. On the one hand, this huge potential and then, on the other hand, the fact that most African countries are importers of food and of electricity. And that's a huge mismatch. And we try to bring up um, ideas how you could bridge or, or to, to address the, the, the key uh, issues. And for example, here it's that, uh, or one of the key issues that Africa doesn't have agro-processing because it doesn't have electricity. And it also lacks the people who want to engage in that area. So we try to find these different areas and to, and to we, we ask for intersectoral approaches. And that seems to be one of the most difficult uh, things to do for development agencies because they still work in their sectors. And we try to, to break that open. But I think it's still, um, still a bit of work to be done there. Um, actually, about your point on education and concentrating on your own culture, I think it's a very interesting point and I would like to discuss this with you because um, uh, the question I would actually have is um, to what extent can you concentrate on your own culture of education when you live in a globalized world? Don't you have to kind of follow the, the what, what's what's there in education at the moment. Like, um, if you want to advance your country uh, on the global markets, don't you have to have the people who, who are absolutely up to date with, I don't know, economics and, and what what's so on. And I would also like to, to ask, what is the role of women in the traditional education systems? So, so it's actually, I don't have answers to your questions. I would rather have you know, questions or, or, or points to So I, I will maybe just pick two points, maybe also um, answer to the remark that um, Africans know best how to teach. Africans, and I fully agree. And for this reason, I am so happy that uh, more than 90% of the researchers from Africa we sponsor in Germany go back to their countries for, for working in higher education and research. Of course, um, they have learned a lot. Um, during their research stay, and this will also make them better teachers. But you have the same effect that a researcher from Germany goes abroad and learns a lot of new methods and um, um, has a new cultural context goes back. He always will be a, a better teacher um, as a researcher. And um, I am absolutely convinced that African researchers know best where are um, the fields 
which have to be taught at the university and where research should be done in. And I'm always angry when people from um, Europe tell me, well, Africa should um, do research and teaching at university in this field. Um, only applied sciences. Basic research is, is nothing for Africa. They are not at this point um, at the moment. And this is absolutely not true. So I agree, Africans know how, what, what best to, um, to teach at African universities. And there is, of course, also a cultural aspect in it because only somebody who's grown up in Africa and knows um, what um, life in Africa is will be able to do this in a very, very good way. Um, researchers from Africa, they tell me, well, you have to be tough for doing research in, Ger in Africa because there is always something which will not work or which is missing. So this is really a challenge. I think many German researchers, if they went to an African university and tried to do um, uh, to work in the lab, they would um, leave very quickly because they're absolutely not used to the circumstances. So I agree that Africans are very the best experts for doing um, teaching in Africa. The second point may be, um, um, you s I think it was also you who said that the poverty is only the result of, of many factors, but it's not um, the biggest challenge in itself. I think um, this is true on the one hand, but on the other hand, um, up, um, poverty has become a problem in itself in many African countries, because in many countries there is a big mass of very poor people, and it is not uh, possible, it seems impossible to change the situation. These um, people are not reached by any economic progress. It is um, very difficult to change something in their situation. And so I think, to some extent, poverty in, in some regions of Africa has become a problem and a very big challenge in itself. Yes. Uh, I will build from the last speaker. And actually, much as I agree with the issues you raise, poverty still remains a critical component of Africa's problems. I can give an example. Recently in my country, there's a big man who was working in the Prime Minister's office who had swindled over six billion shillings intended to go to the poor country and had put up a house, residential house, of 27 rooms. And this guy had only three kids. And everybody is like wondering, how would such a man holding such a responsible office, having such a small family, put up such a huge fam uh, house of 27 rooms? And it's very, very easy, easy to understand this. This man, from his understanding, is that I have been brought up in poverty. I, grew, I was born in poverty. I grew up in poverty. Now that I have an opportunity, I can exploit as much as I can because the future is not predictable. I mean, you can stretch this to politicians who remain in power. Some of them actually would have loved to come out of power, but they have, you know, people behind them who hold them hostage and say, but if you leave power tomorrow, what about us? Hmm? You have to remain in power so that we can continue taking advantage. Talk about power. The power dynamics in Africa is mainly patriarchal. You don't ask somebody who is in power. No. At family level, for example, when you are uh, the father or the husband of the family, everybody takes your word. Whatever decision you make, everybody goes by that. So this also has sort of perpetrated poverty in a way. You'll find in a family, decision depend on one person, the husband. The, the wife has no input. The children have no input. If, for example, the man wakes up today and says, I'm going to sell the family land. 
the woman cannot ask and say, but if you sell the family land, where are we going to, to go? You don't ask that. So this goes on and goes on and goes on. People are not sure of the future. So when they get advantage to be in positions of power, they want to exploit as much as they can. So poverty impacts on our politics. Poverty impacts on our family life. Poverty impacts on our resources at family level, at the national level, at whatever level. So actually poverty remains a critical challenge for Africa today. Yeah, well, there are uh, several issues that have been raised by <laughs> the audience. Uh, uh, my friend, uh, Mr. Dawit, uh, uh, asked us, uh, we have not addressed, you know, the causes. Uh, we have talked about the effects, you know, I mean the consequences, of course. Uh, if we study, you know, human civilization, human culture, they are interchangeable, you know. The causes of, you know, progress for me, uh, for uh, an economic development and from sociological point of view, the mind is the very you know, focal point. You know. As long as we are conscious enough, we can produce two aspects. One is a positive culture, of course, he told me that there is no negative culture, but we produce also habits, you know, that prevents us to see things beyond, you know, the given circumstances, you know. What that means, you know, culture is the product of the human mind, whether you just believe it or not, you know. Human beings, you know, when they started, you know, from hunters and collectors of fruits, you know, and they become settlers. What motivated them to become settlers and then to practice in you know, farming systems, you know? What motivated them, you know, from that, you know, to just produce, you know, more and exchange you know, their own products and to build houses, shelters? What motivated to organize, you know, markets and so on and so on? That is, all these aspects are, you know, the uh, products of the human mind, you know? At a certain social juncture, you know, the cultures that the human uh, uh, human beings have produced become obstacles, you know. Uh, you know, there comes through times, you know, what we call it, you know, power relationship, you know. Some guys try, you know, to control the resources. They do not like to change the status quo, you know. That has been the case in the Greeks, that has been the case, you know, in Ethiopia too, that has been the case, you know, in Europe from the 6th century AD until the 14th century AD, until they have challenged, you know, by the enlightened men, you know, because that time, you know, there was poverty, there was hunger, there was, you know, uh, disease like cholera and so on and so on, you know. They were challenged philosophically, scientifically, you know, Dante, and, and uh, Cousinus uh, from Germany, and many, many other sub challenges, you know, that the status quo must not, you know, uh, continue like that, you know. That means, you know, uh, culture and cultural products materially and immaterial, you know, the habits, uh, religion is immaterial, but we believe in that, uh, the products of our mind. That can be an obstacle to a certain extent, though it has positive aspects. Uh, but on the other side, the material condition what we change, hmm, that have also affected uh, uh, And from that point of view, it's very difficult to say that is the main cause, that is uh, the, the less cause and so on, because the situations are more complex. Hmm. Uh, the other thing what you have raised is, you know, foreign intervention. You know, that has been since immemorial, you know, in Africa since the 15th century and the Europeans and the Americans uh, don't uh, want to leave us because they love us, you know, that is, that is the, the, pro <laughs> the problem. <laughs> the problem, but that is a short-term gain because as you see, you know, the world is, is in turmoil, you know, with that kind of, you know, wealth accumulation everywhere, you cannot go further, you know, just you have to come to a point you say enough is enough, you know, uh, because we need peace, uh, we have so many pressures, ecological pressures, climate changes, and so on and so on. We can, you know, you know, bring all these things, you know, down. We can uh, solve all these problems, you know, as our lady said, 
if we have empathy, you know. Huh? Now, especially men do not have empathy. Those who are in the power, like take Trump, like Erdogan, like the Philippine leader, and so on and so on, they don't have you know empathy, social empathy. You know, they, they become you know uh, very dangerous for me. You know, you know, from that uh, point of view, you know, we have to raise our consciousness. You know, consciousness. I think the Germans, philosophers, Kant, Hegel, and others they have discussed. You know, enormously, and we have to. Uh, take that as benchmark, you know, in order to uh, transform our service. And the other thing, what you have mentioned, is you know, uh, Africans could you know develop uh, by themselves if they are left alone. I, I don't see that way, you know, because you know, culture must be fused, you know, because uh, in one area people can you know uh, produce culture, but cultural dynamism comes, you know, if you hi study the history of humanity. If there, we have cultural contacts with other nations, that has greater impact than you know, just for identify yourself as that is myself. I have to keep my identity and so on and so on. That has never been the case, you know, in our blood, you know. Huh? There are Arabs, there are Africans, there are whites and so on. So we don't know, you know. Huh? You know that gives us, you know, strength. This kind of a cultural contact, cultural dynamism. You know. Without that, you know. Uh, uh, there cannot be development. But what we need is, you know, we have to sort out, you know, what we need for our development, you know. Huh? There are things, you know, are, which are roaming around the world in the name of culture, you know. Huh? And we have to sort out so that, you know, to reduce the negative aspects of this kind of, you know, culture, you know. That is the issue of every individual intellectual and the politicians, you know. They have to have develop a cultural institute, you know, to sort out, you know, which is suitable, which culture is suitable for development, and so on, so on, so on. Uh, I think that is that is uh, the point, you know. And uh, our lady said, why about Africa? You know, you know, as I said, you know, uh, Africa is the most impoverished continent, the most tortured continent. If you uh, <laughs> take it into account. If, if, the most, you know, raped continent, some say, you know, because that has been the case, you know, throughout the last 500 years, you know. But on the, the other side, you know, I don't like to insult or Europeans who have friends, who have, who have my teachers and so on, who love Africa, who want to change the circumstances, you know. And from that perspective, you know, Africa is a huge uh, continent. It has potential. You know, we have to just to, you know, to sort out the potential which gives us, you know, a kind of dynamism so that we can solve the problem, you know, within 20, 30, 40. That is, that is manageable. The South Koreans have proved, uh, the Japanese have proved, you know, what we need is, you know, leadership, a good leadership and intellectual force could change, you know, the circumstances. But the point is, you know, not, you know, on project by project basis, that is completely false. We have to solve the problem, you know, we can solve it holistically, you know, a holistic model. I have developed a holistic model how we can solve the problems, you know. In the country. Mm -hmm. If you t as take one aspect, you cannot solve the problem, hunger, poverty, and disease, and, and medical care, and that touches almost 80, 90% of the population in each country. Huh? I see it out, thank you very much. Thank you. Mm. Okay, so I would like to, to thank to all our panelists for, for here today, uh, but I, I want to just for a moment to, to remember the, the topic of, uh, of our panel. It was the challenges for Africa and the path ahead. So we can see here, even from the typo, title, we also like to, to see a positive side. So I would like to, to be on the positive side. And all of us know the problems of uh, demographics and the rising demographics in, in Africa. And we relate only to, to problems, to issues, <coughs> okay? But it's uh, any possibility for us to think and for everybody else, if we can relate the, the growth of the population with possible potential benefits, can we see benefits? Can we see strategies? Can we see development? So maybe this is something that we should uh, think in the future because uh, the challenges, yes, are great, but also the potential is immense. Mm. And being here in, uh, in Berlin, being here in Germany, and uh, in Europe, uh, as all of you know, Europe had some bad 
bad problems here, okay? We have two world wars. And uh, I'm coming actually from a small country in, in Europe, in Eastern Europe. It's not so small, but it seems like small. Romania, and uh, back home we have a saying. Uh, it goes like this. Hope actually is the last to die. Yeah. So I think all of us should have, have hope and uh, think for the future with, uh, with confidence and again with hope. So thank you all again for everything. And with this, we'll conclude our evening.